Hello everyone, I'm Pastor Dylan and welcome to the Dayspring Wesleyan Church Podcast. The best way to stay connected to the life of the church is downloading our app. Simply go to the App Store, search for Church Center, and download the app and enter the information for our church. This will connect you to our church community. I pray the following presentation will inspire you to come closer to God in this journey of faith. Enjoy listening. Uh, we're going to be looking at John chapter 21 today. I have to tell you, I was overly aggressive in what I thought I could get in today's sermon and found out it's just not going to happen, okay? So for some of you who are notes takers and need to fill out all your stuff, I need to prepare you. You're not going to fill out everything today, okay? We'll hit some of that like next week. Um, but we're really getting into a, um, uh, the passage here in John chapter 21. And if you look at the book of John, one of the things you'll notice that it feels like that John could have ended in chapter 20 because Jesus has already come to the disciples. Um, he's met with them. You know, um, they're glad he's alive. They're excited now about the ministry. Um, you have uh, Thomas who wasn't there, remember? And Thomas then uh, says, you know, I'm going to believe in him until I see him and put my hands in and see the nails and the, the holes in his hands and then be able to touch his side. And so then Jesus shows up again to the disciples and tells Thomas, here you go. Here's the hands. Now put your hand here and you'll see that I'm real. And so anyways, so it feels like it really could have concluded with that moment. And even John said, and I write all these things basically so you'll know that he was in fact the son of God, that he is God. Okay. So that's why John's writing these things. Well, then we get into chapter 21 and I have to tell you the reason I love this chapter is my all time favorite character in the Bible. Historical character is Peter. Like, I love Peter's boldness. I, I not only love his boldness and the way he steps into things, but I also love that he's very transparent and saying, these are the mistakes I made. Yes, I'm the one who denied him. Like, he owns up to all that. Like, I'm just very impressed with Peter. And it was really important for John at the end to say, yes, we know that Peter denied Jesus, but you need to understand that he did, in fact, restore him. And I think that's a powerful message for all of us. Because even in the midst of the sins that we've committed, even in the midst of some of the wrongs that we've had, you and I need to understand, as John was pointing out, that you and I can be restored. Now, getting into this passage today, one of the things I was thinking about is, uh, because Jesus has a meal with him at some point, I started, and again, I'm a food guy, so, I mean, as you could tell. So I, I was thinking about, have you ever noticed uh, when it comes to eating, have you ever noticed that there's different levels of hungry? You know, so I, I often say this, like there are what I call like when you're just a little bit hungry, you know, and the problem with being a little bit hungry is when you're just a little bit hungry, it feels like you can never figure out where you're going to land on as far as what you're going to eat, you know? So I'll always say, and my wife and I, we're going to, well, I think it's time to eat. You know, we're just not really sure about it. And I'll say, well, where do you want to eat? And she'll say, I don't care wherever you want to eat. And so then I'll be like, well, let's eat a house on Hidden Ann. Nah, not today. I'll say, well, then can we go to Burger King? No, nah, I'm not really feeling like Burger King. Well, um, you know, can we go to Applebee's? Nah, and I'm thinking, are you kidding me? You said that it didn't matter, and it obviously matters, you know? But the problem is, we're not really hungry, so we're just like, nah, we don't really know what we want to do and how we want to get into this. So there's that little bit of hunger. Then I would say uh, another type of hunger for me uh, and this name may not be for everybody, but when I have, uh, when, when I think my day is, feels like a little bit more pressure or when there's some things that are harder to deal with, or I feel like there's some decisions I have to make, I get what I call a nervous hunger. And what I mean by that is all of a sudden food begins to call to me. All right. It's like, it comforts me. All right. It loves me. Okay, like when I go to that food, that food doesn't care how I intake it. You know what I mean? And, and it just, it's soothing, you know? And so, and so you have some of those comfort foods that we know about. And I have to tell you, my comfort food, honestly, is it, I love mashed potatoes, but there needs to be a pool of butter in the top, you know? So if you ever go to those old potlucks, like if I see that crock pot with the butter sitting on top, that's my first scoop. You know, I'm sorry, I don't care about the rest of you. All right, that's what I'm going for. Uh, but then I also need to have... Uh, chicken and noodles over top of it. And oh my goodness, that is so good. You know what I mean? But it just loves me in that moment and stuff. And so it's not a good thing, but it feels good at the time. Um, now I know this is, by the way, I know this is dangerous talking about this right away in the beginning of the sermon. Cause a lot of you guys are not like, look, where are we going to eat after this? Okay. Like that's all you can think about, you know, 
Um, but then I also think that there's what I call another type of hunger that it's this hunger that can never be satisfied. You know, it's this hunger where you're like, you're like so hungry that almost nothing makes sense. So when I was, uh, when I was single, I remember a lot of times that I would go into my cupboards and there would be nothing there again, cause I'm single. And so I didn't know what to do. And so I would eventually be like, man, I'm so hungry. So I would go to the store and when you go to the store, when you're hungry, you know what you do, right? You just buy a little bit of everything. All right. So I buy a little bit of this, a little bit of that. And then I would get home and I don't know what I was thinking, but I would make all of it. You know, and so it was just like Chuck Smorgasbord happening at the house, you know, and I would eat everything that was there. And at the end of it, the funny thing is I just still wasn't satisfied, you know, but, but it it did taste good though. I will say that, you know, but I just wasn't completely satisfied. And then I have what you would call also where you have this desperate hunger. And I mean, where you, where there's nothing around, um, you have no other options. You're so hungry and you will just eat whatever is there. A lot of times we'll see that, you know, especially in like third world countries where like, you know, they're just gonna eat whatever's there. Uh, For us, we don't kind of have that as bad. Uh, But I remember this one time driving, I was so thirsty and I was trying to be good about what I drank, but I I was just getting tired of water. And so I wanted something with a little flavor in it. And there was this drink, I don't know if it's called bubbly or something, but I decided to get that drink and it said zero calories, but it did not say zero taste. All right, I wish that would have been on there for me. But I, I put that stuff in my mouth, and I'm telling you, I thought I was, I was just like, and I didn't know what to do with it, and I swallowed it, and my wife was like, what's wrong? I was like, man, this is the worst thing I've ever tasted. You know, but she's like, well, you want to stop and get something else? And I'm like, no, we're, we're, we were late for what we need to get to. And I was like, we need to keep going. And uh, I kept drinking it. She's like, why do you keep drinking that? And I'm like, I'm so thirsty, <laughs> you know, like I need it. So it was like, I would just keep taking this in and in. And I know that if you and I would sit here, we could talk about all kinds of different other hungers that are out there. But I was thinking about when we get in this passage is this, is that, man, there is just a real hunger in life. And I think for some people, there is this, what I would call a little bit of hunger in life where um, life's okay, but it, it just seems like there could be a little bit more to life. Like I, I really could enjoy some other things. And so do you think, man, I'd like to sample this or that, but nothing really sounds really good. And, but you know, you'll try things from time to time and just, it, you know, nothing, it's just nothing good because you're not really hungry. You'll just kind of take what's there. Um, there's also, I think for some, there is this nervous hunger that we have in life where there's the pressures of life. There's the pressures in relationships. There's the pressures in raising our kids. There's the pressures at work. And we feel like something needs a change or something needs to fill our life, but we just can't experience fully what we need. And so we turn to all these different things in our life, hoping that they'll comfort us or they'll take care of the situation where we'll find out really they'll just end up flat as it goes. And then for some of us, we have this hunger that can just never be satisfied. Like we come to life, we're desperate. We're, we know we need something. We need a change. We need, we need a change in our family. We need a, a change in life. And you'll try just whatever's out there, hoping that it'll fill the void. But at the end of the day, it just never does. And then for some of us, you come to a place in life where you're just so desperate. You just need some sort of change that you'll just take anything and just be okay with it in the moment. And at the end of the day, it just still never fills the void that you need. And the reason I say that is because if you've been in the faith or you're just stepping into it, what you need to know is this, is that Jesus can fill that void in your life. He's the one that can satisfy your soul, the missing part that is going on. He is the one that can step in and be that. And listen, at the end of the day, I'm not gonna tell you that everything's gonna be great and good. But there is an assurance that we have when we come to faith in Christ. I point that out because the disciples had this hunger and thirst for something different in the world. And they were figuring it out with Jesus. And then you have to remember Peter himself who had denied Jesus. And had seen him come back to life. is still trying to search his own spirit and soul. And Jesus comes in and restores him. And instead of reading this whole passage for you in the beginning, I just want to read the couple verses that deal with Peter, and then we're going to get into the whole text here in a minute. But if you read with me from John chapter 21, we're looking at verse 15. It says, when they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, well, feed my lambs. 
Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, well, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Let's pray together. Father God, I just pray as we examine this story of Peter today, and as we hear it through the words of John, that we would be a people that understand even in the midst of our faults and even in the times that we've denied or mistreated or have really sinned, that there is a work taking place around us in which you want to invite us to eat with you. You want us to invite us to sit with you. And you want to begin to restore us. I pray that we would be a people that would understand the importance of repentance. And understand that you are faithful and just to forgive us. Father, if there's anything that I would get wrong in what we're looking at today, I pray that you would clean it up in the ears of your people. So yours is the voice they hear from and not mine. In your name we pray. Amen. So we already have this story of, uh, in the historical account. And we know this is true, but we've seen Jesus showing up to different people at different times. And he's showing up once again to the disciples. So this is the third time he really showed up to them. Um, I want to begin with verse 1 in this passage. It says, Afterward, Jesus appeared again to the disciples by the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, also known as Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them. And they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. So again, what's interesting is that the disciples had already been through Jesus being beaten, being on trial. They've already seen him die on the cross. They know that his body was put in the tomb. They know that his body was missing. And so they had to deal through all those tr struggles, all those emotions up and down. And then they had an experience where they saw Jesus in a room with them. And they got to actually see the, the holes in his hands. They got, to, they got to feel his side. Like They experienced all that and they were filled with joy. And then Jesus said to them, now I want you to wait. And he told them exactly where he wanted them to wait. Now, what's interesting about waiting is waiting can be very difficult for some. It can be more easily for others. And I want to ask you this question because it's something that the disciples had to wrestle with. But how are you waiting for Jesus? Like we know that Jesus is returning someday, but how are you waiting for Jesus? And there's really two kinds of ways that we can wait for Jesus. There's one that I would consider passive waiting. And that passive waiting would be somewhere where we, we just kind of wait there and we hope that Jesus will come and we're not going to do anything with it. Now, I wasn't part of the big Jesus movement that happened in California back in the day. But from the stories I hear that many of them, when they were experiencing the outpouring of the Holy Spirit there, they were in such a place that they believed that Jesus was going to immediately come. And because of that, they were afraid to do anything else in life. They just wanted to wait for him to show up. And so matter of fact, some of their friends after sitting in those processes for some time would say, well, I think I'm going to go back to school. And the other ones would scold them and say, why are you going to go to school? We need to wait here for Jesus because he is returning soon. And so they didn't want to get out there and do anything else. And for some of us, we can look at that and say, well, that, that's just ridiculous. Like, you can't just wait and wait. Like, there are things that you need to do in life to, you know, take care of yourself and stuff. So why would they wait there? And listen, church, I want to challenge us that I believe that there are times when you and I could be accused of passively waiting. I think that there are times when you and I see that there's problems in our marriages but you and I will pray to the Lord and we will just passively wait instead of really trying to invest and make sure that we get some things taken care of. Like passively waiting is the idea that I'm just going to pray to the Lord and I'm going to hope that he changes her or his mind and instead of my mind. And instead of getting treatment or getting to somebody who can help and counsel us or getting another eye to look into the situation, we're just going to passively wait and we're not going to invest anything into it. 
There are situations, I think, at times when we know our kids are heading down the wrong direction and really instead of getting involved, like we have a tendency to just say, Lord, I need you to step in the situation. And I want you to understand, I have no problem with you praying that, but there are times when you and I need to get out there and get some help for our family that is taking place. But there are times that you and I just kind of passively wait. There are people who, even in our church right now, that are going through some major diseases who would call to the Lord that he would just heal them. And they just passively wait instead of maybe going to the doctors or going to people that God has blessed with the abilities to help treat what's going on and, and we just passively wait. And I think the, still the struggle at the end of the day is even if we get to the next step about being more active, that we can do all the activity we want and maybe the miracle still doesn't happen and so there's a struggle in it. But there's something about active waiting that you and I need to understand and need to cope with. The active waiting is to say that I'm gonna do something in the midst of all this. Like I see my marriage is falling apart so I'm, I'm gonna go get the help that I need and I'm gonna pray that God will bless that time. Um, there's things that are happening with our kids and we'll say, you know what, I need some help and I need to get some guidance of others and I need to sit down and talk to my kids and I need to go to work and even though this is gonna be uh, trouble, I need to invest in that because that is important and that is beginning to be actively in the process. You see, Peter, I think he's a guy that just can't stand still. You know, and Peter's looking at this and he says, well, we're waiting on the Lord, but he says, you know what, in the meantime, here's what I'm gonna do. And church, what I wanna encourage you just like Peter is understand this. I think that there are times when you and I, and, and I've dealt with uh, teens uh, for a long time. And one of the things I'll notice is they're like, you know, who is that special person that God has for me? And I wanna challenge you on that thinking. And I wanna challenge you a little bit on the thinking that there is only one job that's out there for me. Because when I read scriptures, what I understand is this, is that sometimes God just gives you the desires of your heart. There are times when God will specifically say, this is the person for you, or this is the job for you, or this is what I'm calling you to. But there are other times when God says, listen, I just want you to step into something, and then I want you to invite me in, and I want to bless that situation. So for those of you who have not been married yet, and you're waiting for God to shine a light on this one person, and all of a sudden a beam of sunlight is going to show on this person, and it's going to be, you're going to be like, that's the person for me. You know, I would encourage you not to go up to them and tell them that, you know what, God just showed that you were for me. Because if God didn't speak to them about it, you're going to look really stupid. All right? Okay? But what I would encourage you to do, when you jump into a relationship with somebody and you get married, then work at it as working for the Lord. When some of you have an idea of, this is what I would like to do with my life, whether it's going right into a job or going to college to get some knowledge for the job that you want to obtain, what I would encourage you to do is work at it as you're working for the Lord. In other words, give of your best and watch as God blesses the rest. You know, that's an important sort of thing. And so what I love about Peter is Peter's like, man, we got to do something. I just can't sit here all the time. And he actively gets involved. And what's interesting is when Peter does this, you can kind of see this natural leadership within Peter, right? Because Peter's like, well, I'm going to go fishing. And the other guys are like, then we're going to go with you, you know? And so Peter being a fisherman invites them into this process. And I want to encourage you sometimes, some of us, when no one else is doing anything, there's an importance for some of us to just step up and do something, so even when life is going wrong, we can't just lay there. We just can't sit there. Like, we have to do something. And Peter says, let's go do something. And at the end of the day, guess what? They catch nothing. Oh, that's poor leadership right there, right? He invites them to take in this process, and they're thinking, dumb Peter. He made us go out here in the boat. We're not catching anything. And he's the fisherman, da, da, da. You know? But listen, they went because they were willing to follow him. But then in the midst of this process, what I like is because Peter's always the one who's just willing to go in and step up and do something. We get to verse 4, and it says, Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. You see that theme happening over and over again? Jesus keeps showing up, and they don't recognize him. They don't realize it's him. And listen, I want to be fair to the disciples in this moment because they've already had a touch with Jesus, so they've already seen him. But listen, from where they were and from their vantage point, there may have been a mist in the morning where they couldn't really see who Jesus was. There might have been because they were so tired because they had been fishing all night that you know, their eyes weren't giving them the best look. And then their boat was a little way off, so they may have not recognized that it was Jesus. And the question that, that stems from this to all of us is how often... 
is Jesus there and you and I don't even recognize him? I mean, think about that. There are times and moments in life in the midst of tragedies that we're going through that you and I may not even recognize Jesus in that moment. There's a great biblical passage in Genesis where we have the story of uh, Jacob and his brother Esau. And you remember they wanted the blessing of the Lord and Jacob tricked his father into giving him the blessing that was supposed to be for Esau. So Esau really gets upset about it and says, I'm gonna kill you and come after you. And so we read that Jacob flees. And when Jacob flees, it literally says he goes to a place that was God forsaken. In other words, the place where he was at, he could not feel God, he couldn't sense God. In everything that was going on in the life of his tragedy, he could not feel the presence of God. And church, I think there are times that you and I can identify with that. I think there are times that you and I go through sicknesses or trials in life where we feel like, man, I just don't see God in the midst of this. Like, where is he showing up? And we feel so displaced and we feel so out of control and we just feel like we're in such wrong that we try to examine ourselves and say, what all have I done? What do I need to clean up? And it says that Jacob, in the midst of this God-forsaken place, lays his head upon a rock He falls asleep, and in the midst of his sleeping, he begins to have this vision or a dream, and there's a ladder, and there's angels coming up and down it, and all of a sudden, he wakes up from this dream, and listen to what he says in Genesis 28, 16. It says, when Jacob woke from his sleep, he thought, surely the Lord is in this place, and I was not aware of it. What I want to challenge this church is that sometimes that in the midst of what we're going through, that God is still at work and you and I may not even notice it. It's always amazing to me that even in the struggles and even some of the hardships of life that I've been through, even some of the things that I don't feel free to share, like even at the end of it, there's still tragedy that occurs, but when I see God show up, all of a sudden I realize later that God was still in that place and he was working things out for his good because it was impacting somebody else. But there are times, much like the disciples, when I don't even recognize him in the moment. We get into verses five through eight, and it says, he called out to them, this being Jesus, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. The disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. And as soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off, and he jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. Now, what you have to understand, and this is a great story, and you still got John being John, by the way, because he's still reminding everybody that there is the disciple that Jesus loved. You know, and he's the one that recognizes him first. So, you know, you sort of get this. But listen, at the end of the day, I love... I love John. I'll get in that a little minute because of how he addresses the Peter situation. But literally what Jesus asked in that moment, and you got to think about this. These are guys that have been fishing all night. They were fishermen. They knew how to fish. And Jesus literally asked the disciples if they had anything to eat. Do you guys have anything to eat? Now, listen, I've been fishing all night. I would not be real happy that I haven't caught anything. And then when I feel like I got this smart aleck ask him, have you caught anything? I think I would be a little amped up inside, you know? And I think for me, I would be thinking, are you kidding me? Listen, man, we've been out here all night and I might have replied no out of, no, (laughs) you know, out of frustration. Um, I would have been thinking, it's like, hey, uh, Captain Obvious, uh, you know, you can see we don't have anything, right? Um, And why would we still be out here if we did? You know, like when we'd be coming in. And so what's interesting, though, is, and I, could, I almost feel like, I don't know that they did this, okay, because I could be reading into it at this point. But he says, well, why don't you throw the net onto the right side? And I would have been thinking to myself, I'm sure, we'll do what you say. And I would have, if there's a way to sarcastically throw the net onto the other side, I would have done it. There you go. You happy now? You know? And then it says, when they look, there is all this fish in there, too much for them to carry. And it's kind of like, okay, this guy was, and then John's response is what? The one that Jesus loved, John's response was like, uh, it's the Lord, <laughs> you know? And I love this because listen, I think somewhat to somewhat degree in their mind, it's like, John is a great thinker. And he's like, wait a minute now, this happened one other time to us. 
you know? And all of a sudden, we, when you and I think back to Luke like 5, uh, verse 8, we read this passage that uh, early on when Jesus is calling the disciples, it says that Jesus gets into Peter's boat. Peter's boat goes out a little ways and Jesus begins to teach from that boat. And then he says to them, well, let's go ahead and fish. I want you to throw your nets over. And Peter's like, look, we've been fishing all day. Like we kind of know this thing because we, we know fish. We've been out. You keep to preaching. We'll keep to fishing. And all of a sudden, Jesus says, throw your net over. And they do, and it says that they catch such a large amount that their nets are ripping, right? And stuff. And listen to Peter's response in that moment. All right, listen to this. In Luke 5, 8, when Jesus does that early miracle, when Simon Peter saw this, basically he heard what Jesus was preaching, and now he sees this miracle. Peter saw this. He fell at Jesus' knees and said, go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. And I have to tell you, that verse, when I've read it, has literally cut me to the core. And the reason why is because there have been times in my life, in the midst of tragedy, in the midst of what I'm going through, that I have doubted God being in the situation. There are times that I've asked the question, God, are you real? Because I don't know how you're going to work in this situation. And then it's amazing to me because then all of a sudden when God says, look, keep the faith, keep the faith, cast your net over here, do this little thing, keep faithful, do this. And in the midst of the tragedy, which is so a tragedy, God shows up. And I feel like Peter who has to say, Lord, I don't even deserve this. Because I doubted your resolve when you knew all the while what was happening. You see, let's be honest, when certain things happen, there are some things that can only be explained by the Lord. There are times when God works a miracle and heals somebody's life that I don't understand it, but I just have to give credit to the Lord. There are some times when friendships, marriages are reestablished, and I don't know how they got reestablished, but all I know is that the Lord was at work. There are times when kids have run very far away from the Lord, gotten a lot of mistakes, but then all of a sudden they have an encounter with the Holy Spirit, and for whatever reason they come back to faith, and I can only give credit to the Lord. I don't know how he does it, I don't know how you explain it, but I just know that it's from the Lord. We get into verses, um, uh, well, let's go on for a little bit though. Uh, Peter recognizes though, that it's Jesus after John says something. And then Peter's response is great, right? So I don't know exactly know what he's wearing, but it doesn't sound like a lot, okay? And then it says all of a sudden that he decides I'm gonna go over to Jesus. And it says that he basically puts all of his clothes back on, which by the way, that's probably not the best way to swim, right? Especially with their clothes in there. But he puts it back on, he gets into the water and he gets over to Jesus. Why? Because there is something comforting for him about being in Jesus's presence, like there's a security there. Things are gonna be all right. And Jesus wants to get over there as soon as he can. And church, listen, there is something powerful to me about being in God's presence. And I can't explain it always, but there's something good about it. And I would love to share with you about all the things that have happened in this week. There is nothing that has affected me specifically, but there are things that are affecting people that I love. And there's some pretty tough things that I've had to sit in. And it's hard trying to find God in the midst of all this. But I have to tell you, when I came to the first service today and I heard us singing the first song and realizing that my name's written in that book, they, that was powerful for me. And I don't know how it was for you, but I needed that this morning. But there's something where I'm like, you know what? I'm ready to run to Jesus because I need to be in his presence right now. We get into verses nine through 11, and it says, when they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you have just caught. So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153, but even with so many, the net was not torn. Now again, I think that passage is funny because um, somehow Peter got out of the first amount of work by dragging the boat back with all the fish. You know what I mean? He's like, I'm gonna go see Jesus. The rest of you can bring this boat in. But now that he's all there, he says, I'm gonna help you guys. But what's interesting to me is they're mentioned the number 153. All right? 
Now listen, I would love to tell you a great thing about it. I don't know what was going on there. What's interesting to me, there's a miracle happening and somebody is so messed up on numbers. He's like, I'm gonna count every one of these fish as we bring him in. You know what I mean? He's like, one, two, three. They're all like, man, this is the Lord. And he's like, oh, I gotta count these fish, right? Like we gotta get in the market or something. Like they're still counting them. I heard uh, one guy said that at the time, and I don't even know how he knows it's true, so I'm not sure that it's true. But he said, I think there was 153 species of that at this time. And so that's what they needed because that was Jesus' way of saying, we're going out to all the world. I have to be honest, something sounds a little fishy in that statement to me, okay? So, all right, there you go. I'm done with the dad jokes, I think, for a little bit. All right, and so anyways, what's interesting though is this, is that when they landed, Jesus is already, he already has a fire going. He already has fish on there, but he says to them, why don't you bring your fish and put it here as well? Now, here's what I need for you and I to understand. Jesus already had fish, and he asked them to add theirs to it. What you and I need to understand is Jesus doesn't need your help, but boy, he loves your involvement. Jesus wants to take what you've been working at, and he wants you to bring it alongside, and he wants you to see that all this thing that you work for and this little that you give, I want you to see the blessing and the miracle that occurs out of this. And church, there have been times when I have worked for things and I have given that it feels like a little, but in the midst of everything else, man, when you see the blessing, it is just awesome. There are times when I've been on missions trips and we all had to scrape and get all of our money together. But what God does on a missions trip for us personally and what God does through that team is absolutely incredible. There are some of the most exciting times are on mission trips like that. There's exciting times when you and I as the church get together and we all do a little bit and we see big things accomplished. So when you and I come out and we all just bring candy and, and we just give it to kids who are coming out, I mean, there's something special about seeing that smile on that kid's face when those 1,800 kids come to our campus. Like there is something dynamite about that. And yet my portion is only this, but God invites you and I to be part of the process so that you and I can see the blessing. He doesn't need our help, but boy, he loves the involvement when you and I get in and partner with him. So then at the verses 12 through 14, it says, Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread and gave it to them. And he did the same thing with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. So I'm gonna move very quickly through this part because I wanna get to this one other part. We're gonna stop and then kind of be done for the day. But what I want you to understand is this, is that Jesus is inviting them to an intimate meal with them. And he really wants to feed their soul at this point. He says, I know you guys have been in desperate. I know you're trying to process everything. Let's just eat together, fellowship together, and talk together. And there is an importance in that. And I think in our culture, the, the older we get, doesn't it seem like the busier we get and we just don't have time to sit down anymore? I mean, one of the things that I miss about my, my, my kids right now is my kids are getting to the age where they're going every which way. And for us to have a family meal is almost non-existent anymore. And I've had to tell myself, we got to build that back in because there's something powerful about us as a family sitting together, talking about life, sharing a meal together, just slowing down for a moment that we can take in each other's company. And there's something good for the soul in that. There's something exciting about an Easter or Christmas when the extended family gets together and we all eat a meal together. And it just feels like that time just flies by because we're just enjoying each other's company. And Jesus just wants to sit with them and eat with them. He wants to feed their soul. And listen, it's the reason why it's important for you and I to take time to read his word in order to take time to pray so that you and I can communicate with God. We can sit down, we can eat with him and we can fellowship with him. We get into verses 15 through 17. And this is, we're going to end with today, but we're going to take a little time here for a minute. It says, when they finished eating, Jesus said to Simon, Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Now I want you to understand what's happening in this process. You have to understand again that Peter denied Jesus three times, right? Now I want you to think about this for a minute. Jesus had told Peter that I'm going to build my church on you. You're the rock. This is the person that says, Lord, I'll do everything I can for you. And Jesus says, you're going to deny me three times. He says, I'll never do that. And then he denies him three times. Now listen, 
if that was me in leadership, this is probably not the guy I would be convinced is gonna be able to lead the church. Matter of fact, to some degree, this might have disqualified him. And I might have said, you know what, Peter, I know that we said we wanna do this with you, but because you denied and because you've caused problems, listen, I'm gonna have you do this other little job here because I think you'd be better suited for that. But you have to understand what Jesus was doing through this whole process. Jesus, instead of rejecting Peter, invites him to eat with him. Which, by the way, may not make much sense for us, but that was a very intimate thing. When you invited somebody to your table, you were telling them that you are a guest, I'm pouring into you, I'm investing in you, you can eat at this table, you can enjoy all this stuff. And it was a way of saying, I respect you and I love you. And that's what Jesus was doing for Peter. But then it happens even a little bit more. Jesus in that moment pulls Peter aside. And he says, now let me even have a deeper, more meaningful conversation with you. And I love this because it's almost like John who he says, I'm the one that he loved though. I'm the one that he loved, you know, but now he's pulling Peter aside. And I can imagine he just wants to kind of, you can almost feel John just kind of listening in and seeing what's going on over here, you know? And I have to tell you, um, and I have to apologize for this, but man, I love listening to people's conversations. I mean, I just can't get enough of it. All right. And I feel like I, I could be a gossip almost, you know what I mean? Because I'm like, I love to listen in and hear what stories are going on and see, you know, see what's taking place and stuff. And, and I have to tell you, even this week, I was, at a, I was at a baseball game for my kids. And what was funny to me is, well, first of all, I don't know why this happened, but some kid came up to me this week and he said, uh, he was 11 years old. And he said, you're the pastor at Dayspring, right? I said, yeah. And he's like, I heard you make $4,000 a week. And I'm like, I'm like, what? And then I'm like, I am being robbed by the church because that is not my paycheck, right? You know, I don't even know where that came from. So I'm already feeling like kind of like a little bit strange. Well, then I'm listening into this conversation going on behind me and these people are talking about church. And I was like, oh, this will be good. I love church talk. You know, I love to hear what's going on, you know? And then all of a sudden I heard this person go, and you know what I heard about day spring? And I was like, oh, this ought to be good, you know? So, and I literally, I'm sitting with a day spring shirt on by the way, okay? And this conversation that my, so I'm trying to lean in, man, it was one of those conversations where you can't fully tell what's going on or hear everything. I was like, oh man, I want to know this so bad. But then I thought to myself, I should just turn around and say, well, you know what I heard about Dayspring? You know, I heard the pastor's like six, five and he's the best looking pastor in town, you know? Cause if it's going to be gossip, I want it to be good stuff, right? You know, but you can almost see just John trying to listen in on what's going on. And then Jesus makes these statements to Peter. And I think most of us have heard messages where, and this is a message I've given, and I I love the sincerity in it, but Jesus asked Peter a question three times, do you love me? And we know that this is a part of restoration for Peter. It's a part of dealing with what he did and the guilt and shame he felt. But we understand that Peter denied Jesus three times. So we kind of get the importance of the question. But what you and I don't get, because we don't have the Greek necessarily, is the words that Jesus is using. Jesus says to him the first time, do you love me with agapo or with a agape love, which is like a 100% love? Like, do you love me like that? And I want you to watch how Peter responds. Peter responds, Lord, you know I love you. But his response is, which is basically um, like Philadelphia, like the brotherly love. It's, it's not 100% love. It's like a 75 to 80% love. And Peter was basically kind of telling Jesus, Jesus, like, I love you. And I wish I could say I love you 100%, but you know that I denied you. And the, Jesus comes back to him again and says the same thing a second time. He says, do you love me? And he says, with that 100% love. And after the first time he said it, Jesus says, well, go feed my sheep. And then Peter again responds the second time. And again, he responds like, I, I love you, but man, I just feel so bad about what I did. I don't know if I can fully say that I love you with 100%. I love you as a brother. And I, and I love you with that 75 to 80% love. Like that's where I love you. And then Jesus says, well, then go take care of my sheep. And then I want, watch, I want you to watch what happens the third time. 
Because it says after this third time, it says Peter was hurt. But this third time when Jesus asked him, he says, do you love me like a brother? And now he's questioning, do you really love me? And Peter's response is, through tears, Lord, you know all things. Lord, you're the one who said I was going to deny you three times. Like, you know all things. And then Jesus says again to him, now go feed my sheep. You see, Jesus wanted to confirm and wanted to restore Peter to say, Peter, look, I still believe in you. Even after all these mistakes, I still want you to come church, we're going to end on this part today, and I'm going to ask you to stand right now, because we're going to take communion together. And here's what I want you to know. No matter what you've done, if you and I can come to the place where we can repent of our sins, acknowledge our wrong, and we can admit, then Jesus invites you to eat at his, his table as well. And the question becomes today, do you love him? says then come and eat with me you who are walking fellowship with God and are in love and harmony with your neighbors and you who do truly and carefully repent of your sin and intend to lead a new life following the commandments of God and walking from this time in his holy ways draw near with faith and take this holy sacrament to your comfort and meekly make your humble confession to almighty God let's pray together oh God of grace and mercy we thank you that you ever loved us and provided for our redemption. We thank you for your son who died to save us and for your spirit who invites us to draw near. Guide us now as we commemorate the suffering of our Lord. Help us to remember the cost of our salvation. Help us to commune with you and with each other. And so consecrate the bread and the cup, which are here prepared that we may partake of them. We may receive the spiritual benefits of Christ's broken body and shed blood. In his name we pray. So church, at this time, here's what I want you to know. We practice what we call open communion, which means you do not have to be a member of this church. What I simply ask you to do today as you're coming forward to recognize, here's the junk, here's the stuff that I've messed up in. And Lord, I want you to know that I love you and I want to be forgiven. And I want you to come today and have fellowship with them. So you're going to come take the elements. You're going to come take them back to your seat. We're going to take them together. Uh, If you have gluten-free stuff, we have that up here as well. But why don't you come forward at this time? Thanks again for listening. If you are located in the Marion area, we would love to have you join us at one of our Sunday morning gatherings. For directions, service times, and information about our fantastic children and student ministries, please visit us at dayspringwesleyan.org. That's dayspringwesleyan.org.